Nope. Um, but it ended up what I was working on, I didn't get as much time as I wanted to with it. So I decided to uh, do something a little bit different. So taking a, a small break from it. We'll get back uh, back on Thursday. We'll go back and take a look at it. But I did end up naming the world for uh, that module. Uh, and I ended up coming up with uh, Grikor as the name, which means broken in Draconic. So the world space itself, you know, as far as the module was concerned, Vercel, that kingdom that existed, is now just a bunch of realms uh, with the heirs, the different bloodlines and such, trying to keep that idea of that kingdom alive and battling against all those forgotten or lore driven foes that are in the space of that world so i ended up doing the pitch part um, and what that is is as far as the worlds when i design worlds like general worlds um the first thing that i do usually besides drawing the world map and then building modules from that space you know the widest view and then zoom into the different locations and pinpoint locations across that um, global space that I created, develop it all out. I do a world pitch of, and what it is is like a, just a quick uh, sort of paragraph that covers the basics uh, of that world space. Just what is it about, what's happening, that kind of thing. So I said, uh, the shattered kingdom of Vercel in the east struggles against ancient evils almost forgotten. The lands of Dronirin in the south spill forth evil upon the shattered kingdom, while the lands of dragons to the west hide ancient ruins and monstrous enemies. Heirs from Vercel and those loyal hope to rebuild Vercel and reclaim the lands of men. Hunters venture into the seas of monsters, hoping to bring back treasure and trophy alike. Those brave enough to venture into the West might stir old blood wars between men and dragons. Time will tell if the world of Grikor will fall into darkness. And that's sort of the world pitch um, for that space. So we did go through and do some, um, we did the foundational design for the module. Then we turned around and we did the expanded module, a module built from that foundational uh, platform one of many possibilities uh, we just sat down and cranked out a module uh, what waits beneath from that foundational platform and a foundational platform can be used by tons tons of people and really um, it helps to teach and train how the imagination can create and how the space can create so that's what we did we built a suggested module from that foundational platform we have the foundational platform and we have the module. So we took those two things and the next step would be the uh, professional and publication space, right? And we will get to that, we will do that. But before we did that, we decided to build the world space. We took a, a quick look at what we needed and then drew up, uh, we, we took a couple of streams there and drew up the foundational space for the world through the continents and then layered in all the different things and went over how uh, to use the different tools that I use um, to build a world map. I like to build the world map from the widest view, the orbital view, I like to call it. And then we uh, designed up, you know, where those locations needed to be and kind of allocated the space properly so that it would fit uh, in there the way that we needed to. So we needed to have enough room one for the different things in the module but the things that were in potentially other modules which we took the time to develop out a few possibilities just from looking at the world map what could be here what could be there and what other options do we have for building some things in the space so with that being said usually what i do is i give it some time right give it a decent amount of time and then I go back and I do some edits, which I was doing earlier today. I was working on doing some edits on the module, um, the uh, module we created from the foundational module. Um, I built out uh, an easy system that does that. 
Um, and we're going to go over that on Thursday on how to go through the module and take and do your own self-editing through it. What best ways to do so? Uh, because it's a good idea to learn how to do those things. Um, a lot of times you don't have an editor and a lot of times it's, it's uh, more professional to take the time to look at your own work and see and be critical of your own work, be able to do that, have that skill and go through and do the edits that should be done before it goes to edits, right? It goes to the professional level of editing. Um, so I went through and I started working on that I'm about halfway through the module, and I do that before I go and do the professional version of it, uh, before I do the publication version, which adds a lot of flavor text in there, a lot of um, additional info that ties to the different things, expands on the thought process a bit more from even our design, uh, which is that second stage, the, the hypothetical module, right? The one that we built, the adventure module. And the different characters and such in there. And what I do when I go through and do the edits, I'm also making some notations of key elements within it. And in actuality, I thought about renaming some of the encounters we named them, but I was thinking of renaming them, uh, some of them, because in the end, it ended up being centered around something a little different than I had originally uh, anticipated or planned for. We had used a certain aspect with the name and uh, the briefing in the quick play layout to help build out uh, the module. And it helped to stir ideas and things, and the ideas are designed to take in direction. So some of them, uh, they went different a little bit. Uh, when I went back through and took a look at it, I was like, well, I went a little different here. I could rename this technically and do it a little different um, as far as the way that this is pitched. Or I could go back and edit it and put it back to the way that I had originally thought. Either way, the encounter uh, works both directions, and I usually take a look at that encounter like that. And I will build it out both ways, build it the way that we had it, and, and rename it, possibly. Or take a look at going back and maybe making some changes if I needed to, to make the story flow the way that I would like it to. Again, we're providing the space for the players to do whatever they need to in that space. So, the idea, right, is we write what's happening in the space and we give the dm gm or geo enough information to support them and to support the ideas of the players decisions so there's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen we didn't allocate what decisions the players could make we just said what's happening whether they do or do not do anything the story in the space right the responses from the things happening because of the players actions is up to the DM, GM, or GO provided by the tools and such and the information that we provide. They're able to flesh it out in whatever way. And I usually build the modules with those three different aspects constantly trailing along each other because usually players pick one of those three. It's not a matter of by design it has to be, but typically a player group, even random, will tend to follow one, two, or three, right? Depending on which one of those paths. And I just write my modules in that fashion. But I don't have to do that. Like I said, we can expand it out to five or to seven, depending on the variability of the module, uh, what is required. Uh, if I've had modules where I've expanded out to 10, right? Full contingency advanced uh, module is expanded out to 10. There's 10 different hooks in there. Uh, there's tons of different encounters happening, side quests, all kinds of things. It's a mega adventure enough information there to stand by itself for a long time. So we didn't do that with this one because it's a foundational module. It has a purpose. It's designed to teach and train, and that's what we built it for. It's designed to help inspire the imagination and get the imagination going, and to do it properly so that a DM, GM, or GO can learn how to build a module and has a support structure there in place to help teach them. So with that world pitch, like I said, I do the world pitch and, and, and then I usually, after the module, I take a bit of a break and I start doing some edits, which I was working on earlier. And in that process, a lot of times when I'm doing the edits, I might pick out information, uh, like I said, and grab that and make some notations of that information. And then I use that when I do that build out for that uh, publication professional aspect, the last stage 
um, of adventure module design. So depending on what level you need, you know, you can do it. If I was just running the module, if it was just for me, and I am going to be the DM, GM, or GO in that situation, I would only do the foundational module, and I wouldn't have had to take the time to do anything else, technically. I might make some notations in there, uh, but a lot of times I just run right off the foundational module. Other times I do the second stage, right, and I do a hypothetical based off the foundational, and I just run off of that. Uh, and I do it fairly quickly. Uh, I can crank one out literally at the table as I'm ready to play or build one while we're playing. Uh, I have the capability to do that, and Contingency will do the instructions on how to do that as well. But a professional uh, aspect, a publication aspect module takes more time than that. It takes a little more time. Uh, if you are the only person working on the module, if you're undecided on the space, you don't know the space, and you don't know the player group, right? You're building this thing for a wide audience, wider than usual. Then it takes a little bit of editing and a little bit more uh, creative process. And that process we're going to go over and we're going to do. It's probably going to be the next week um, when we sat down and started doing some more tabletop RPG stuff. Uh, so for Thursday, what I'm planning on doing is we're going to go back and take a look at that module. We're going to look at the edits. I'll have the edits in place, um, kind of go over those edits that I made, some changes, and then the notations, and then we're going to start building out um, those kingdoms and such that go with it. So what I do as a good little keep me away from the space long enough tool, right? Because that's the idea. You want to be away from it long enough that you come back to it and look at it with fresh eyes. If you just keep working on it and working on it, you're not going to catch everything that's in there that you might need to change or whatever. That's why I pace myself when I'm doing the edits. I'll usually only work on it for a little bit, and I'll say, well, that's my time limit. I don't have any um, additional time for that. I'm going to have to wait till the next time and continue on from there, pick up where I left off, and, and keep going. And I may backtrack and say, oh, I didn't catch this one thing here, whatever. And again, we're going to go over how that process works uh, on the next one. So today, what I was thinking about doing, the plan is, uh, we set that module, make sure this doesn't fall, we set that module to the side for now, and we build another module, right? We build the foundational aspect for something else. We did this one in the most primitive stage, right? The most basic, so it has the most use. For this module, we're going to build it focus right off the bat. We're not going to go through and build it foundational in that broader sense. We're going to fine tune the components right away before we do anything else. So let me get this up and running. Should be able to do this. Let's see if I can't get this to camera. I would prefer the camera angle to be it's better. All right. I like it slightly at an angle. Let me see if we can get this booted up here. We had one without anything on it, but everything was allocated somewhere here. I think this one possibly. I think this one. Open one, two, three, yeah, this one right here. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to save as. And this one is going to be So for this one, I already know the name of the adventure itself, mainly because of when we were doing some of that design work for this module, 
when I was doing the edits and stuff, I started picking out some different details. And then that world map gave me some ideas for some things that could be happening in other locations. And I always like to think of if in that space we decide that something happens in the module, then as a designer, we forward think that process through into something else happening later on. How does what we did here affect that space too? So in our adventure module, uh, the Horn of Osir gets corrupted by um, Salt of the Seer and Azakir. So that instance when they were going through and they're going to the different druidic uh, standing stones and, and circles and things like that throughout the realms to repower the horn of Osir to amplify it for a time, what have you. They drained some of those uh, locations out of their power, prevented uh, them from being a conduit at that point, basically just drained them dry to amplify the horn's power, its dark um, essence spilling forth onto that space and backlash. They drained the good magic and replaced it with a darker magic. So what happens when they do that, right? That was the thought process. So the Spires of High Forest is a module. Uh, my idea for it is those locations, someone comes across one of them. Because remember, the module's forward thinking. It's foundational. It's designed to progress forward and then to build more spaces after it's complete. So it does that. It's doing that. We're, we're going to take a look at that particular aspect of it today. And I want those events and the people that were in those events to continue forward. I want this event to be happening in the wake of that that someone else discovers this thing happening. This is an after effect of the adventure module. The things happening in that module, this is that leftover behind, right? And a lot of times when I was running games um, at the FLGS, the local game stores, because uh, I had a, a few uh, different events running, usually every time I was there. And then we gamed, you know, every day. Um, and especially on the weekends and such. So we'd go in and, and we'd have the two two-hour blocks that we would do events. We'd have the first two-hour block and then the second two-hour block. Sometimes they would link, sometimes they wouldn't. On the weekends, and a lot of times what we would do with that is we would allow the groups that were participating there to have the events that were happening in, the, in that world space at the time to trickle over into each other's spaces. So they were all doing different modules uh, for the groups, but the modules are in the same space and they would kind of trickle out. And what would happen in this one would start to affect that group and the things that that group would do would affect this group and it'd be back and forth. And they didn't know that until the end of the season. And then we sat down and went through, and I, I do the wrap-up for it for the season before the holiday times come. And we take our breaks and only do holiday events. No more weekly stuff for a while. That's when they would learn that process. So, the thought of having the um, event trickle over kind of thing is what we're going to kind of go with in this particular setup that we're going to do today. So let me just go through and, and get these fonts shrunk back down like we did before. Eight works the best. Ten works great on here for you guys to see, but as far as the space on here, you can still see it pretty well, uh, but I go over it anyways. So... You won't miss out. I, I usually read it back. So on here, 8 works great. That's what I got set up. Usually we get on a lot earlier than now, but we're about an hour or so behind 
my starting point that I usually am at. But the reason why I was looking at a couple other things for some other streams, I'm just going to go through and do these here while I'm talking. There's a bunch of events that were happening in some of the games that I'm playing on the other days that I stream, and I was just watching some recaps, and of course I had to eat. I couldn't do the stream without eating first. I only get to eat once. So. Gotta make sure I get that done. So I had to make some spaghetti, and that took a bit. I didn't end up start uh, doing dinner until it was almost time to stream about a half an hour before, so wasn't much I could do about it. I knew we were going to be behind. Wasn't, wasn't anything I could do. And we'll do some edits and shuffle arounds on some of this. Again, all this text and stuff that's here is from the other module. I'm just going to shrink this down. This is the foundational module. Some of this is foundational module. What I'll do is I'll end up saving it as a template on here, and then it'll just be easier to do. The rest of these we'll do as we get to them, but these ones were already allocated. In. We got the notable NPCs and things like that. I'm not too concerned with that right now. I won't go through and do all that. Um, let me copy this. Save this. Let me see if I can't. Let me do this. Close this for a second. Let me see if I have the other one already edited to that point. Looks like this one is pre edited. They're at nines, which is fine. We've got the text through the whole thing. Yeah, we'll use this one. Paste this here. Get rid of this. Move this up. This needs to be centered. Save as. Should be able to see that on there. Yeah, it looks like that. We'll see. See if it opens it up. If I type, see if it pops it up on the stream. Yeah, okay. Just making sure that it's picking it up. It's a little behind. It's hard for me to see what it's doing, but we got it. All right. So the plan for this one is what they end up doing in that module at some of those Druid sites is what gets discovered here, what it ends up doing. So um, let's see. Or I'll say,
So the effects of the events surrounding the Horn of Osir begin to surface. The druidic sites of Nactata crumble and wither. Dark foliage begins to entwine. The stoneworks pulling them apart. Spires emerge skyward. So, in that event, basically what's happening is that dark power is starting to creep its way back into um, the world. So, the... I'll say sacred stones once guarded. I'll say, I want to say the effects. I'll have a spell baker. Ice cube. I don't know. I'm tired. And this thing doesn't pick it up, so whatever. I'll look it up later. Let's see.
Okay, so the sacred stones that once guarded the world of Grixor from entities beyond are failing. The site's powers, drained by the Seer Salta, have left a gap in the network of magic that once prevented entry from beyond. Black twisted vines pull apart the way stones, and ichor seeping spires push their way through the platform stones that once housed focus altars used by the Noctata Druids. As each stone fails, the threat of something beyond becomes more and more present. So, in the background, what's happening in the past or behind the scenes, I guess you could say. So, So, the Nactada are not aware of the Druidic Sites failing. They have yet to discover the work of Salta or the effects of the corrupted Horn of Osir. As the spires make way into the realms, dark things begin to appear. The world's flora and fauna suffer the effects of the Icar, and the Standing Stones are disrupting the flow of magic in the shattered kingdom of Versal. The High Forest Realm is in danger most eminent. So, Adventure Synopsis. Uh, stop. I want to go in here. So, synopsis.
Um, Okay, so the Druidic sites are failing. Once they protected the realms from entities from beyond, holding back those things clawing their way into the world. As more and more sites fail, the threat becomes more known. Things move in the shadows of the forest. Crops wither, fauna becomes mad and sickly, even attacking travelers who venture too close. The spread of the darkness can be traced back to the sites. Those first set upon from Salt of the Seer, to power the dark horn of Osir. In the shadows, Azakir watches and waits. With each passing day, the spires push ever skyward. So, uh, you know, back jacket and pitch kind of thing. So, starting the adventure, I put bone-like spires peak the canopy of the high forest. From afar in the realms, it is noticed. News travels of mad beasts and failed crops. Villages begin to be found with nothing but death to greet you. <laughs> creatures from the dark have come so adventure hook um we usually uh plug them in as we start to build out the module usually those first couple of encounters will give us an idea of what we want to use in this particular instance i'm gonna put at least one um
So when illness has stricken a nearby village, it is beyond that which can be magically healed. So something's happened. Uh, and we'll come back to those other two later. Uh, so the first encounter, the first initial pitch. I'm thinking instead of pulling the players from the space that they are, that the module begins in the space in which they are. It makes it a little easier than having to move the players to get them to the module, rather bring the module to them. So, uh, So in counter one, I said, in the shadows of a campfire, things move eerily among the towering trees. In the canopy, an owl hoot is abruptly silenced. In counter one. In counter two, after their night of absolute terror, the players are like, there's no way we're staying out in the woods any longer. We're going to get to the next nearest village. Um, village of... Resident. Uh, let's see. Okay, so to make it obvious, there's no fire, so it wasn't a raid of some kind. It's just bodies among... Okay, so let's see. Among... Let's see, I want something good. structures strung like decorations where they had been nothing is alive yeah, yeah that sounds good so uh village of resolute that's what i put in there so there's no fires just bodies among structures strung like decorations where they had been nothing is alive this is what the players end up discovering it's just everything is dead there's nothing alive anything that was once living is gone everything gone so the third encounter so they're at their campsite something comes at them in the night they don't get a good look at it of course they battle whatever whatever it is ends up that they don't find anything in the daytime there's nothing 
no blood, no nothing. It's just whatever the heck it was, you know, ghosted them the entire night, attacked them. Maybe they got an injury, don't know. Uh, by the time Encounter 3 happens, some of that stuff might pan out, that they notice that if they did get injured, it's not healing naturally. Um, so they might make their way somewhere else and then find that, obviously, uh, magical healing doesn't work on it either. So that kind of ties them into the thing in order to get um, that taken care of. They're going to have to do something. I mean, they can't just not do anything. So it could mean their demise. So the village of Resolute, when they make their way from the woodlands into the uh, civilized world, they come across a village. There's no fires, right? So it wasn't sacked or anything else like that. They don't see anything in that nature. Just bodies among the structures. So if there was somebody hammering away on a thing, they're strung up into the thing. If they're in a room or whatever, the body's hanging from the ceilings. If they were out on the streets walking, they're dangling from whatever um, structures they had outside there, across the fence posts, whatever. Shredded, just absolutely just a, um, a mess. Uh, a, a meat market, right? So, strung like decorations where they had been. Nothing is alive. It doesn't matter what. Even a street rat is dead. There is nothing that had any sentience of life that is left alive. It's all gone. So by the time Encounter 3, so they leave that place, obviously. Uh, they, the water's nasty. The, the whole place, it's done. It's gone. So they move on, press on, and make their way to the next nearest place, and that's where they find that um, sickness. Sickness has taken the city. Uh, market is, I'll say, the open market. All the keepers of the city screen. Seeking entry. Yeah, and we'll leave it at that. So, sickness has taken the city. The open market has been closed, and all keepers of the city uh, are screening. I'll put our screen. Screening those seeking entry. So if somebody's trying to come in, they check you over. Find out if you got any injuries on you or anything else. Uh, bite marks, whatever, right? You got any of that, you're not getting in, right? Or they might direct you towards a healer, possibly. We'll have to play out how that uh, happens to go. And that's the stage being set um, for that space. Perhaps if they are uninjured and happened to come across whatever it was, battled it, and then it left, and they were successful, right? Because there's always the chance that they're successful, just as much as there is for a failure. Or even neutral. Nothing happens on either side, right? It doesn't move in either way. They just depart. Daytime comes, perhaps, right? The sun, they battle all night, and then the sun's cresting sends them back into the darkness of the forest, right? The canopy. So, um, um, let's say. So as daybreak comes, a call to action comes with it. The spires in the high forest have been seen. And they would notice that from the city, obviously the walls and such. They've been, they've been tied up doing what they've been doing. 
But in this particular instance, they find out, you know, something's up. So, um, de you know, departing in that direction, it means more travel in secluded <laughs> uh, canopy, which could be a risk. So, as they're traveling to that, when the players take the road or, you know, whatever, someone comes with report, if they don't leave, if they choose not to go, perhaps one of them is injured or something to that effect, someone will eventually show up at some point. So within the next two stages, you know, one, two, and three, you know, that's three, we expand to five, expand to seven, and then out to ten. So the fifth encounter is where we're going to wrap wrap the space in such a way that the players are making some sort of definitive step in the direction of the module itself. So I'll say injury without I'll just say injury without healing for now, and then I'll put um, questions about the dark, and then the other option is the the spires. So, if one of the players has an injury it's not healing that will motivate them to do what they need to do right they might notice it's starting to have problems at this point questions about the dark the things that have existed once before and all of that uh, might pop up someone might have killed one or found one dead that they just you know it didn't make it into the shadow of the forest, let's say, before the sun came up and it killed it. You know, the just the light destroyed it. Or the spires themselves is the is the, the course of action, where they need to go. Uh, find out what's happening with them. They've been counseled to do so. So again, uh, the injury that isn't healing... Uh, They seek the druids of Nectar. No choice. Um, option two, questions about the dark. Uh, they have find, or at least, discovery of light. What that does to these things. And then uh, the spires. So that's the, the travel, travel to them, and then rotation. From what they run into, something else might pop up. So then all of those things, regardless of what it ends up being, uh, in this one, knock top. Dark horn. Here. So the Nectata Druids and the Dark Horn of Arsia, basically. By the time that they discover that whole thing, then we're basically to the point in which we have Salt of the Seer. Her hut, where she's at. And the uh, workings of the horn. Right. Because she's there, so Salt of the Seer, her hut, and the workings of the horn. The things that she's doing to it. Twisting it further. Uh, trying to do different things to it to make it do it. And the more she messes with the horn, um, 
or she computes or amplifies Warren's power. More the spires grow in the high forest. So, reawaken in guardians. Preparing the standing stones. Discovery of So reawaken. All right. So salt of the seer, her hut, workings of the horn. Uh, the more she imbues or amplifies the horn's power, the more the spires grow in high forest. Uh, in the counter seven, Nacta druids, and the dark horn of Osir is what they end up to discovering about it. So salt of the seer, her hut, the workings of the horn. The more she imbues and amplifies the horn's power, the more the spires grow in high forest. So she's in her hut. She's tampering with this. It doesn't mean that they're going to go there and battle her with it, but they know that that's what she's doing. They can kind of affect it from afar, because remember, the more that she made connections with those points, it's like they're connected to the horn, and she's able to use those locations once she's corrupted them from whatever range she happens to be at. So the idea would be to go back to those locations and repair the stones, right? To, to cut her off, to unplug her connection with the horn at those locations. So reawakening the guardians of high forest, uh, repairing the standing stones and discovery of the healing that will work to cure this sickness from this, this dark uh, realm. So in the end, um, severing the dark horns connection to the standing stones in high forest. Turn the guardians to their slumber. And then the cure for the dark, pretty much. So re-raking the guardians of high forest, repairing the standing stones, discovery of the healing that will work. Uh, to cure this darkness. Severing uh, the Dark Horn's connection to the Standing Stones in High Forest. Uh, return the Guardians to their slumber and cure for this darkness is basically the overview for that uh, module. And I might... You know, the Spires of High Forest is what triggers it, but I might put... Well, no, because I want to... If I named it the Dark Horn of Osir, it would be pretty cool. Instead of the Spires of High Forest, I could use the Spires of High Forest instead of the name for that. Uh, could change it to the Dark Horn of Osir um, as the adventure module. It's possible. I don't know. I'm going to toss it around. It'll either be the Spires of High Forest, uh, which is what is happening because of the effects of the horn. And those spires is what's causing the module to happen, which is kind of why I pitched it that way. The spires of high forest not revealing, so to speak, them being able to... Because whatever you name the module, the idea is that that tangible aspect is accessible. If I say the Dark Horn of Osir, that would hint at the players being able to find the horn more um, than just being able to deal with its effects from afar. It would give it um, that tangible factor if I ended up doing it that way. And I don't want it to be accessible to the players in the module. I don't want them to be able to get a hold of it. Their only option is to sever the connection at the source, right? Those different sources. So there are 13 of those 
locations in the realms. We didn't mark them on the world map at all. So what we'll probably do, because uh, we're going to end it here with this in this particular stage, because that's usually what I do is I get to this point and then we take a take a break and then we come back to it again. So Thursday when we come into it, we'll continue with this and delve out the encounters that go along with these. Uh, we'll probably also take a look at the map um, if I haven't done that already and figure out the locations uh, where these standing stones are in High Forest uh, on the map, which I'll pull the map up here for a second. We got it. This one's pretty. One without color. And I'll do this. I could pull it up on the screen, but I didn't scan it in, so we'll do it this way. So this is the this is the world map. So in the particular instance of it, High Forest is here on this side of the river, over on this end. And this mountain range here is what separates it from the coast. There's a little bit of uh, land space here, but this location, this valley that's next to the forest uh, area, this mountain range from the river, this whole space right here, this whole location next to the river is where High Forest is. That's that particular uh, location. And the Druid, the Nakta Druids have standing stones in those locations, that whole space, all the way down, even into um, across that river, there's other ones, and they have them also in the realms themselves. So when the Druids build their structures, the more that Salta ends up making the connections as she's moving through the lower area, and starts corrupting them with the Horn of Osir, using it to gain power. She travels up and through there because it's easy for them to make their way through and, and down because they're trying to get into the realm, and they know that the people from there, uh, uh, the knightly faction is actually on the other side, the river. They're all the, they've emptied the lands and went across to where trouble had been. They had left their, their lands essentially unguarded, uh, their cities are guarded, but the lands are not being patrolled as per usual. I kind of like to think of it as like the Rittermark, you know, from Lord of the Rings. Normally the knights are patrolling that entire space, and they're not. They had merged their way through in force, down and across um, that eastern realm, across the river. There's bridges to get across, the functioning bridges into the other realms, and down. The reason why they had done so is because a call had come uh, from one of the villages and it was being attacked and they had answered. It takes them some time to cover that distance. Obviously, it's a, a sizable space. So when they make their way down, that's kind of what happens. They kind of do that uh, and see what they can do. So I think the Spires of High Forest is a pretty good thing. If I, if I use... The Dark Horn of Osir, which is kind of the thought process for the module afterwards, where they actually go after the uh, Salta and the Horn. So I'm trying to build uh, what I do typically when I build a module like I did with what Eight's Beneath. When the module is done, I like to build the modules that come after it, right? We've built that, and I like to build the ones that happen. So we have the whole series, potentially a campaign series, especially when I have a world space that we built like that. Um, I want to flesh out the modules at least through that um, initial storyline. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, basically build them out. Uh, the Horn of Osir is the one where the basically the, the Spires of High Forest picks up where the previous module leaves off. And then the Dark Horn of Osir, which is my thought process, comes after this one. And they go after Salta and as a cure, potentially. But after Salta to try to uh, destroy the horn. 
they'll be able to use something that they get from this module, or per perhaps the druids are able to focus the magic again. Nacta is alive. You know, she survives. And she's able to use the power of the guardians to reactivate their temple and find the horn. And then the players go after it, fight Salta and try to destroy the horn. Because remember, the horn is, uh, by the time the module ends, is part of Salta. She, it's, it's on her. She looks like an alicorn, is what she looks like. Uh, a humanoid unicorn, is what she looks like. And it's just this black horn sticking right out of her forehead. So she's a, she's a problem, big time. And, you know, that merging of it, the opposite of that, because you've got the battle that happens between uh, sort of like, I guess you can say, pagan magic and the things on the other side. Like the series Charmed is a good example where they're constantly fighting against things from the other realm, right? They've got all these other things they're fighting against. They come through and they, they battle them. Things like that. Um, and that space is what is spilling through these broken uh, standing stone locations. Because you'd almost like to think of it as like these stones were, were put in the, in the high forest, were put as like seals to block out these access points that these things came from. They could exist in the bowels of the planet, right? Could be like, you know, inside the core of the world itself, these things. They don't necessarily have to be something otherworldly. Um, but they live below, like the Underdark or something to that effect. You know, you could use that. Or um, like the Abyss sort of thing, right? So there's a bunch of different things you can do to play on that. But we're going to make our own creatures, right? I like to make my own stuff. So we'll have a lot of really cool looking things. We'll, we'll come up with some monster designs and we'll do some things like that. So all that is probably going to be Thursday. Uh, we'll take a look back at the module, see what edits and stuff we did um, from what waits beneath. And while we're wrapping up that module, we're working on uh, developing the one that comes after it, which is this one, Spires of High Forks. So the Dark Horn of Osir, I think, will be the third module um, in that particular grouping. And then that'll wrap up that, kind of encapsulate that, wrap up from that first module gives you a good uh, starter into the space and then the other modules that happen after are all going to be sort of individualized they can be linked in any sequence but they all tie off of the things that we built from the foundational module what waits beneath the things in that space is where we're going to take a look at all that and, and spread that spread that space out we got the towers for the mages uh, the three that are lost and the seven that still are in existence so there's missions that could be tied with that. We've got the dragons from uh, the Western lands, right, that we can deal with. Um, Vakamos is a problem. So there's the threat of him, which I'm thinking about moving him into his own series, but there is that threat. Um, there's a couple other um, entities which I was working on in um, another module binder, which is over here. I'll save that one. Uh, because that that one there, uh, I started working on before we even did What Waits Beneath, completely separate. And it fits well, because I had designed the Shadow Lords um, as an entity that I could use in a world space. And just have them be a bunch of them. And I kind of developed out like a uh, faction of them and, and how they're broken apart. Similar to the way that we did for uh, What Waits Beneath, so we ended up building this entire world. So this world that we're building out, um, I have other pieces of it I had been developing from other spaces that I'm going to just bring into this world space and just make a few minor tweaks to them because they fit well. Um, they, they work great for it. And then this will just be a, like a very large package um, of all these modules that fit together for this world space. It's going to work out good. Uh, I've got some modules that I wrote up for um, Darkest Dawn, which is another campaign setting. 
and I'm going to grab the modules from that because uh, they're foundational modules that were designed specifically for that. I'm going to grab the foundational aspect of those modules and bring them over to this space and use them to develop out a couple other stories that are happening um, in here uh, because this will work out great. Those modules, probably 10 years old, uh, probably 10. I would say a good 10 years old. So the players have no clue, right? They haven't seen it uh, in such a long span of time. So they won't recognize foundational from that. Um, they might get a little bit of uh, deja vu when they get into the middle of it, but we're going to be taking the foundational aspect and building off of it. The modules that I ended up building off of those foundational uh, platforms are obviously like this, where we detailed it out. They would recognize those. So we're not going to do that, but uh, one of them is centered around um, a thing, an object, which we'll deal with. Uh, the other one is centered around a particular monster, like it's a big bad kind of situation. So we have that. And then we have another one that has to deal with um, similar to this, where there is a thing happening that's slowly making progress. And if it's not stopped, obviously there's no way that the realm is going to survive from it. You know, it's another realm-destroying situation. But the forces that were already working on it, are they're dead. Anything that's tried to tamper with this particular aspect, it doesn't work. Because it's being watched, right? And it's a good thing we've got Vakamos... And he's watching, right, the different leaders and the, and the realms and such. But the players, you know, they may be a thing by the time the first module is done. They may or may not know that he's even there. They're just dealing with the after effects of some of the uh, Salta and Azek here. They might not know much anything else uh, that Azek here is the shadow of uh, Vakamos. And I highlighted that in the module because we mentioned it a couple times in there. There's actually some layering in there uh, because Vakamos is a Shadow Lord or he created the Shadow Lords, gave them power, sentience, however you want to call it. So there's a couple ways to flesh that whole tidbit out. So when I do Vakamos, which will be the first NPC that we're going to take a look at and develop out the story about Vakamos and how the world space uh, was changed from him, and that area that I was talking about on the world map that was like, is there this huge gap there? And I put a giant question mark on it. Uh, you can take a look at the other streams where that uh, location is. And I thought that perhaps there was like maybe a floating island or maybe it was sunk or whatever, that there was something there because uh, it just looked like there was something there. It just like it was broken out of that space. And that was where Vakamos was originally. Like they, the... The battle that took place just wiped that place out of existence. Um, but it was world-changing, right? That is what ended up triggering him to do the same thing and make his way over. You know, his place was taken, so he came to um, Vercel and did the same thing. Wiped out the realm of Vercel in response to their attack that they did on him and his world. You know, because... Um, that location, Dronirin, that whole lower continental space, Dronirin is where Bakamos ruled, basically. He was, he's the lord there. The shadow lords are the ones that reside under him. His, his lords and ladies and, and monstrous creatures, whatever, that pay servage and homage to him. So there's a lot of different entities that are there in that space we can extract and utilize. It gives a good a good world space to do your thing. It kind of reminds me of like old uh, cartoon series, He-Man, uh, Masters of the Universe. And you got Skeletor and you've got uh, He-Man and the other characters all battling in a sort of the same realm, but you've got the two castles and such. It's kind of like that mentality where you have a definitive uh, anti-hero happening in the space throughout the story. Like there isn't a way to remove them. It's like Batman and the Joker, right? 
someone else is going to take up the mantle for either and it's like that battle continues even if it isn't with those ideal characters in those spaces someone else takes up the mantle of the joker someone else takes up the mantle of batman and plays it through the story doesn't stay limited to just their space you know it's kind of reminds me of like even lord of the rings when you had bilbo um uh, and then frodo right still the same ring continuing the story right through the through the uh, episodes and such so but yeah we will uh we'll take that uh this this foundational module space like this um this is this is being built in the same platform um a specific module purpose driven so we have a foundational and we have a purpose module so this is a purpose module this one is designed to bridge a gap between a starter module and a wrap-up module so we're going to do this one we'll we'll flesh it out do all the little kickouts and everything from it it'll look really good we can build some quests and stuff uh, i'm going to do the horn of osir i'm thinking is going to be the quest module uh, we have it and we might as well go through and do that and the quest module will be the horn of osir we'll basically take a look at how the quest module is built uh, it's a little different than these uh, we have the initial foundational module, which we've done. We did the build out from it. And then this is a purpose driven module, a bridge module. And then we'll do that uh, quest one. That'll be great. Uh, the Horn of Osir will work out good. Gives the players that they have to progress. If they don't progress through, then they miss out. If they don't progress, they don't progress. They, they lose ground and have to start again in a different path. It gives them something to do. Right, they got some work to do. But yeah, uh, we'll stop it there, and Thursday we'll pick up, we'll do uh, the rest of this one. Get this one fleshed out, take a peek at our edits for the What Waits Beneath, maybe take a look at that map, figure out those locations for the uh, Standing Stones for the Druids, for those different things. And I might end up figuring out where Oseer's actual shrine and temple happen to be in that, in that space. And it might be by then where I have the um, labels and such done on the world map. I'm going to do the uh, lamination of that probably before that time. And then you guys can take a look at that, how that worked, how that panned out from um, that teach and train instructional that we did. Using the color pencils for coloring instead of doing a digital format to give it that really cool textured and layering effect that looks really nice uh, with that melting of those uh, colored pencils down a bit in the design so uh yeah thanks for watching appreciate it and i'll see you in the next one